This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we are joined by film professionals to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by cinematographer Robert Arnold, uh, whose work includes Reasonable Doubt, The Tam and Kevin Show, and more recently, the highly acclaimed short uh, that pre that was at Cannes, Benny and James. Welcome to the show, Robert. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Now, I guess, can you, because I, my first question is how many takes, <laughs> but I guess we we have to set that up for the audience. So can you give us a bit of background about Benny and James? Uh, I had just, so Benny and James shot in August, Reasonable Doubt wrapped in May. And, you know, it wasn't the type of show that allotted for a lot of winners, right? It just, you know, it was the first season of a episodic series. You know, our budget was a bit limited at times. And just the style of the show wasn't on that um, creative plane, as it were. So uh, I think I had just watched an episode of Minx and they were doing some cool wonners. And I was like, oh man, what if we made this a wonner? And ironically, my director, Logan Vaughn, spoke to one of our producers, Mayan Denton, uh, like before I had even called her with my wonner idea. And she had told him she'd had a dream about it being a wonner. So unbeknownst to me and unbeknownst to her, but I called Mayan and I said, hey, man, I was like, I kind of wouldn't mind making this a one or like I kind of like the idea that if that's possible because you know Logan and I as we were prepping shot deck was very heavily mm. influential and you know we were looking for all the best cinematic angles to cover two two characters in a car that that wasn't moving uh but the one or idea really like spoke to me so when I called my aunt he was like, and I told him about it. He was like, have you talked to Logan? I said, no. He said, she just called me like a day or two ago and said the same thing. And I said, what? That's crazy. He <laughs> said, but don't tell her I told you. I want I want her to be the first to tell you. I said, okay, bye. So I call her and I said, hey, what if we made this a winner? And she's like, Robert, oh my God. She's like, I was just telling my aunt a couple <laughs> days ago, this should be a winner. And uh you know, that's kind of how we we got to the beginning of it. And then she's like, all right, now how do we do it? And I was like, well, can't do it on Steadicam. It's got to be on a techno crane. And, you know, shout out to ProCam. I'm so appreciative for them helping us on this project. Um, and then Logan was like, okay, cool. Let's get to planning. So we rehearsed multiple, like, so it was probably like maybe two or three days of rehearsal without camera. You know, we mm. shot it all on our iPhone. Um, 1917 was one of my references. Birdman was one of my references. But I leaned heavily into 1917 because, you know, that film mostly took place day exterior. Yeah. So, um, you know, I went and did what I always do with any film. I did a deep dive. I did my thorough research and... You know, I, Logan and I had a meeting with our editor uh, and, you know, we tried to figure out how are we going to hide the cuts. And we had a meeting with, you know, our visual effects team. Um, so the planning began, you know, I was like, and and interesting enough, like our, my AD and I, as, as I was plotting the car out with the, with the crane, because the crane had to move three times. Yeah. So... It was like position one, two, and three. And then as we were prepping about what order to shoot in, it was then three, two, one. Then it was two, one, three. Then it was one, two, three again. And then like we kept going back and forth to figure out the best order of execution. Um, essentially, it ended up being three, two, one is what we ended yeah. on. Uh, at the time, COVID was still prevalent and helium was super expensive because i needed a cloud for to keep the light consistent yeah. but we couldn't afford it because of the price of helium and our budget and 
you know, those hurdles. But the blessing was there were these like beautiful pine trees that like were in the just outside of the driveway that mm-hmm. were like maybe three stories tall and it just happened to be on the east side. So I came up with the idea. I was like, if we start at 430, shooting on the Sony Venice. In the morning or uh, the in, in the morning. Yeah, okay. Just making sure. Yeah, yeah no, it's okay. We start at 4:30 a.m. Uh we will have 5 30, 6 30, 7 30, 8 30, 9 30, 10 30, 11 30. We'll have seven hours to execute this. Yeah. So and that's exactly what we did. Our call time was like 3 45, 4 o'clock. The crane was rolling off the trailer and we were shooting by like 4 30, 4 45, and we wrapped precisely at 4 30. And it was beautiful because it was a little bit of overcast. And even if it wasn't overcast, I was still good because the sun didn't come over the horizon of these trees until that time. But literally just as like 1130 landed, the sun peaked out, the overcast went away. And, you know, it was the, the, the our characters would have been, in, you know, hard direct sun. So it, it was, yeah, go ahead. I've been a camera person for 30 years and I fell in love with cinema. I heard there was free film school in France and I wanted to get into the French film school. I really didn't know anything at the time, but I knew at least how to take pictures. So I said, I'll try for the image department. And then when I miraculously (laughs) got into the French film school, I fell in love with working with the camera. You're following what's going to be in the movie. So that immediacy that the camera allows is what I loved from the beginning. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and this is my course about documentary cinematography. Well, no, because like what's interesting is, so you guys obviously stitched, you did it in three things mm-hmm. and when i watched the film like was the decision technical more rather than um for the the actors because look i feel like it would be easier for the actors to go almost treat it like a play and work through their emotions to that rather than mm-hmm. you know i'm going to do it in chunks mm-hmm. was it sort of like so when you were because it is a 14 minute film Mm-hmm. So technically with the technology, you could shoot it. So like, was it more technical that you guys decided to break it up or was it more a creative reason? Cause it allowed for certain things. Like how did, how did that decision come about? Uh, the way we, we broke it up based off of where the sun was going to be. Oh, so like I reverse engineered it so that the camera and its final position was there to um, put me in the best possible lighting condition right before the sun came up over the horizon. Mm-hmm. And, and also it helped me to be in this position so that I could match it to everything else I had done prior. Yeah. Uh, and luckily, like our actors, their backgrounds were in theater. Yeah. Uh, you know, Philip is on The Servant and Calvin, I think, was on Barry Jenkins, uh, The Underground Railroad. Yeah. But like prior to that, they both have been in several Broadway plays and off Broadway shows. So, you know, f- starting anywhere in the script, they were both off book and ready to go wherever we needed to pick it up. Yeah. Which is impressive considering like just the emotional journey that you go through in that 14 mm-hmm. minutes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. It was you great. Know, when you, cause you guys chose to shoot it black and white. What was the the thought? Like, why did you make that choice? Uh, that was, that was Logan's idea actually. And I wasn't against it. Like, honestly, I don't think I've actually shot a black and white film since I was a Columbia College Chicago student shooting on a Bolex. Yeah. So it's been a while. And I've shot like black and white still film with mm-hmm. my Leica. But, you know, this um, this decision, she felt like really the black and white really spoke to the the acting. You know, it yeah. spoke to our talent. And what I learned from it, which like, 
you know, it's not like we watch anything black and white often these days. Yeah. Is that like color is actually one of our senses that we don't really think about. You know, we think about hearing and seeing and touch and smell, but like color is huge. As I was watching it on the monitor, I was like, wow, you really, you really are focused in on what's going on. You know, it says a lot. Like if we didn't have sound design in the score, you were still engaged with what was coming out of their mouth because it was so heartfelt and like relatable. You know, their their story, like any one ethnicity, race or creed can relate to this. You know, it's that pivotal moment in one's relationship where it's like we're turning a chapter in our book that we have to make a decision that's kind of going to change the trajectory of where this relationship and life is going you know and having a kid or even adopting a kid is is huge yeah. you know it's not just you anymore or your wife or your or your partner it's like now it's about the kid mm -hmm. so it's so relatable and 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 you could even say that like black and white makes it very metaphorical you know it's it's that cut and dry there's yeah. no color to it there's no middle it's it's just black and white you're either having a kid or you're not having a kid yeah right and if you have a kid you know it changes things and if you don't have it it changes things yeah so when i, I when i was watching it the thing that really stood out to me was the textures right mm -hmm. like so specifically like the gray shirt you could like really see like the texture in it or like the trees in the background you could mm -hmm. all of a sudden that stands out to me more almost mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which was all which was one of my questions because like and I'm sorry, I can't remember which characters Benny and which characters. Uh, no, it's okay. James, but like um, one of them has a white shirt on. And it's like almost glowing. Mm -hmm. The other one has this black shirt on and it's all text, like little lines. And you can see everything in it, which is really fascinating. So yeah. like, how did you determine that sort of look? Because obviously there's going to be the production designers and whoever, but mm -hmm. like, was there a thought put into capturing these textures or is that... Like, I you know, that was that a, a lot of that was Logan and our production designer. Yeah. You know, like they uh, Jack, I forget Jack's last name, but Logan and Jack have worked have, have been working together for years on all the theater that they've done. Mm -hmm. So outside of like live action work, Logan comes from the theater space as a director. And so she and Jack worked on it, but it stemmed from me shooting a camera test at Panavision. So I shot a a chip chart and I shot a color chart mm -hmm. and then I have my colors Walter Volopato you know grade it great I shot it in color but then he graded it and created a LUT um a black and white LUT for me so and then I share my camera test with Logan and Jack and they're the ones that made the decision on the textures of the clothes and you know it, it made our car decision mm -hmm. um you know no one would know this but the house was red you know, and the car was kind of like whoa. this greatest. Mm -hmm. I thought the house yeah. was white. I was like, yeah. oh, I got like a beautiful like lake no. house or something. <laughs> yeah. No, it's red. Shot it in Brentwood. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, again, like like I was saying, you know, color being one of our senses that's like unspoken for, you know, it plays to those different textures and tones and, and the different yeah. hues. So well, that's really interesting because it felt very... Like you said, like you, it hyper focuses you on the performance, mm -hmm. especially because mm -hmm. like the house is white. So like in when I saw it, like I mm -hmm. look at it, I'm like, OK, that's you immediately build that picture. And then you just, OK, I'm going to focus on them. I can focus on the details of yeah. the conversation, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, um, what I have to ask, how did you, your crane operator, <laughs> your camera operator and your focus puller all create like how did you guys work together to get the choreography down because there's a lot so, of movement in this so so we all gathered the day before shooting and we had what logan would say is called in theater a tech rehearsal <laughs> uh we had a tech rehearsal at procam procam was generous enough to loan us their their storage garage space where they store all their cranes and we didn't even have the original car that we shot in. We actually shot in uh, one of our executive producers' car. She has a Mini Cooper. Totally yeah. not a classic big body Oldsmobile, right? Like, yeah. But uh, we did the rehearsal there. 
And as we were doing the rehearsal and look and Logan and I looking at our notes from the rehearsals without an actual film camera, you know, days prior, we we continued to talk at nauseum about like what's the language of our film, what's the language of the camera movements. And I had worked on Dahmer prior to Reasonable Doubt, and they had a uh, uh, they had rules. They had a, like a camera commandment sheet of like things they didn't do. And I was like, oh, that's so smart as a filmmaker yeah. to challenge yourself to say we're not going to do this and we're not going to do that. And then it creates like this this David Fincher type of aesthetic. So for for us uh the breathing was so metaphoric to what was going inhaling and exhaling mm -hmm. so she and I Logan and I would talk about like this is when we exhale this is when we inhale and that was our motivation behind moving in and out so choreographing it with everybody the day prior they had an idea of what it was going to be but like it wasn't really till we got there and we were in the moment and the pressure's on because like we're we're trying to beat the sunlight and you know we don't have a, a lot of time and our actors luckily they're them being so extraordinary made it easy so it's just about us as technicians making sure that we were in the right place at the right time and you know on the day i was running around tapping my crane operator and my focus pullers, you know, they, my focus puller, he was great. So I didn't have to really worry about him much, but you know, my operator and my crane operator, they both had to coordinate. So it was a lot of coordination and yeah. luckily there was some rehearsal leading up to, you know, principal photography. Well, it's interesting because you kind of, I guess this answers one of my questions. Like you're talking about the breathing in and breathing out, sort of like releasing. Cause one of the things was, is how did you guys deal with the tension because, you know, mm -hmm. like, if, like there were theater actors, we all sit in the theater and it's the performance that we go. If we, this was like traditionally, uh, for lack of a better term, traditionally shot, it'd be like, here's the wide shot. Here's the two or, you know, they are the two shot. Here's the over the shoulder. Here's and we'd mm -hmm. follow that. And then the editor could build the tension with the performance. But in this, you're uh, like there is an editor because it's stitching. But in this, you're actually like having to make these decisions of going in and out. So like. Mm -hmm. One of my questions was, how do you deal with tension? But you kind of answer that with your in and out. So were there key rules or things that you looked for for pushing in and out? Absolutely. It just depend on where we were in the scene and, and mm -hmm. in the dialogue and what was happening. That would determine like us inhaling and, and exhaling. Like, for example, when we come up over the car. Yeah. Right. And we like we see them hold hands. So like that's an important beat in the story. And then when it lands and it turns into like a raking two shot, the camera starts to like exhale a little mm -hmm. bit. And then it turns and it slowly turns from like a medium shot to like a walk. Yeah. And then we push in and we inhale and we come around and it turns into like this two shot because like now it's kind of like then it turns into like not only a two shot, but it's a frame within the frame because we're yeah. looking at them. And they're like at this moment where it's like, we have to make a decision. We've been here before. Like, what the heck are we going to do? Are we going to like move forward with this decision that we've been planning or are yeah. we going to go our separate ways? And, you know, that's when Benny gets out of the car and he storms off to go grab the, uh, the wind chime. Yeah, yeah. You know, so and then we come around again. But again, it, it was like those beats that we determine like, OK, this is where we inhale and exhale. Wow. Now it, it now you mentioned your your colorist before. Is that someone you you work with on every project or is that Yeah. Walter, I was just telling somebody prior to our call that Walter Volopato has been like a family member. You know, like I go over to his house for Thanksgiving or to hang out in his pool when it's hot or just to like have a dinner. Yeah, I reached out so I'm an AFI graduate. And the year that I was there, 2009 and 2011, was the first year that Steve Yetlin came in and taught a class on like banding and pixels and just like digital workflow from like the cinematic space and, you know, building LUTs and trying to create grain textures within that LUT to kind of reflect film in digital. And he had just done, I think, Star Wars with Walter. And I read an article about the two of them working together. 
So I sent Walter a cold email and said, hey, like, you know, I was part of Steve Yedlin's class and I'm very much, uh, you know, I believe in you all's philosophy. Like this is how digital cinema should be treated moving forward. And, you know, I'm really big into like shooting camera tests before doing projects or just like to answer curiosity. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love to meet with you. And he was like, absolutely. And at the time he was working at Photochem. Now he's at company three. So he invited me over to Photochem. I sat down with him and, and some other technical scientist that was there. And, um, you know, we just chatted and he asked to ask me some questions and, you know, it, it resulted in him being like, cool, you're definitely the type of like cinematographer and filmmaker that like, I want to work with. And like, I'm happy to help whenever, you know, let me know whatever you need. And so from that moment onward, we just started working together and like us working together turned into like this beautiful friendship that like, I just, you know, adore. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it's interesting because it's, it's very much like uh, such a key relationship nowadays whereas before mm -hmm. you know we would just have to tell us any art and you know <laughs> run it run it through a couple times and um yeah and so I'm I'm fascinated because you you when you initially talked about him it was very much like well like you said like a friend whereas most cinematographers when I talk to them it's like that's the person we hired mm -hmm. right if that makes sense so it's what do you what would you suggest for young people getting into cinematography to look for in their colorist and how to build those relationships you uh, i'm going to reverse engineer your question okay. how to build the relationships i would say um would be don't be afraid to cold email people because you'll never know until you ask and if you don't ask the answer is always no and yeah. i find that people typically are willing to help those in need that like their intentions are are pure, you know, if you're not out to like get anything and it's not like, what can you do for me? If it's more of like a collaborative um, ask, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, my recommendation in terms of like that working relationship and what to look for is you want to look for someone who's open to experimentation, someone yeah. who's who's who understands the importance of collaboration, someone who gets your aesthetic and like tone of your project or projects um and someone that you don't mind sitting in a dark room with for several hours <laughs> <laughs> you know what many I mean many hours <laughs> many hours so, and, and staring at a screen is it slowly changes like can you change it how about now 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 uh -huh, is it uh -huh. more blue yeah so. and there's like a level of trust right yeah. like I trust everybody that I work with these days like because and my eyes are all handpicked. For example, like before I started Benny and James, I sent the script to Bob Forsh at Panavision in Woodland Hills. And I said, hey, Bob, I'm about to gear up to do this project. I need your help. But more importantly, like I need your opinion. Uh, I think I want to shoot large format. What do you think? What, what lens do you think I should use? Because like I've been using, you know, I don't know what lenses I was using at the time, like something vintage. I was using like their Panavision vintage lenses for a while like that's what I used on astronomy club and then I think I was using like their uh I don't think what was the name of it? like their ultra primes I was using their ultra primes for a while like heavily and so I was like Bob what do you recommend he was like I just got two he's like I got just just the lenses for you I've got the custom large format lenses we made for Bob Richardson for air which were the the VAs, and then I've got these P uh, these P series uh, lenses, um, large format lenses. I was like, all right, cool. He's like, come in, shoot a shoot a camera test with both of them, and then let's talk about it. So I did that. I shot the camera test. Walter graded it, built the LUT in and around it. I watched it with Bob, and we talked about it, and. Oh, ultimately he's like i i get the sense he's like it's just me he's like i think you want to shoot with the bas and i was like yeah you're right i love the characteristics of these lenses they're great uh and the same thing with um walter i was like so i'm looking at johnny simmons still photography i'm looking at elliot arrowitz st uh, street photography um for my black and white inspiration 
And, you know, I'm looking at Paul Thomas Anderson's photography with uh, his work on the master with Mihao. And so I send him all these references. He was like, cool. He's like, I'm going to cook up something. I'll get back to you. So he does what he does best, turns some dials and use his creative aesthetics to kind of match what I was looking for. And that's how we end up coming up with the look for it. So I just, I, I think it's about trusting, you know, whomever you're working with whether it's a colorist or operator or someone at a rental house, like just uh, finding the right people who are willing to collaborate with you and being open to it. Right. Cause yeah. I find many people, uh, I'll say the older generation is very much like, this is my idea. This is what I'm going to do, you know? And so I would say to the younger generation, just be open to collaborating with people that have more experience and, and see the world maybe differently than you, because you might learn something and it might actually be the key piece you need to making your project unique. Interesting. Now, I have a question, but then I realized the way I phrased it might sound weird. What's next for Benny and James? I was meaning for the film itself, not for the guys. <laughs> but if you want to answer for the guys as well, you can. Like, is it, it like is it still doing the festival circuit? Where what's going on with that? Still doing the festival circuit. Um, you know, after can you know our cover letters to festivals have now changed, which is cool. Yeah. So uh, I'm we're hoping to get into the Chicago International Film Festival. We're hoping to get into TIFF. Uh, which would be a dream of mine because I've been to the festival without having a film there twice and it would be nice to have a film in the festival um so yeah just just submitting right now mm -hmm. um in terms of Benny and James what people don't know is that this is one of a three-part anthology oh, so originally with the anthology it was going to be different actors but the theme of like oneers and two characters were consistent but i think logan and i are now toying around with the idea of maybe we keep the same characters and just yeah. kind of have them throughout this anthology along with the oneers and just being in like interesting locations yeah so well, that'd be because they were so like really good <laughs> like, mm -hmm. really strong i was like wow like i yeah. could see a shakespeare play with them for like three hours <laughs> and be like oh, totally cool, over um okay so i have one last question for you what would you say yeah. is your favorite guilty pleasure film or tv show to watch tv show right now happens to be seth rogan's platonic awesome like like literally that's what i'm watching as a guilty pleasure and then movie would be john wick like i saw john oh, yeah. wick a few months ago and i was like this is amazing i mean unfortunately it won't win the awards it probably deserves but <laughs> for guilty pleasure's sake and entertainment it's pretty awesome yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Super appreciate it. And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com and of course on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.